Okay, so I want to now revisit this idea of proper time, which we saw we essentially defined as being the time that an observer measures within their own reference frame. So we said that within your own reference frame, you just sit at the origin of that frame and just travel simply along a world line that traces out the time axis. And so in your own frame, you just measure this world line, you just simply don't move at all through space and you just travel through time. So now we can use an incredibly important property of the, the metric. Essentially we said that the metric is going to be an invariant or a Lorentz invariant. So regardless of the coordinates you use to write down this ds squared, its, its value is always going to have to be the same. So we can now use this incredibly important fact that essentially ds squared is an invariant, and we can look at quantities that we define in one reference frame and translate them into another reference frame. Okay, so we've said in your own frame, the time at which you measure, we're going to start calling the proper time. So this is going to be the frame of our proper observer, so we can just call their coordinate time the proper time. And now one thing which we can now use the invariance of the metric to define is that essentially, well, this observer in their own reference frame is just following a world line. We can measure the length of that world line. Okay, so let's measure the length of this world line in your stationary frame. Of course, we're going to use the metric. And now I'll just write for you the form we had of our metric. So this is the metric in 1 plus 1 dimensions. And now I've expressed it in these tx coordinates. Well, now we can realize, okay, in our own frame, first of all, this t is going to be tau. And this, in our own frame now, dx is essentially going to be always zero on our world line because we're always just traveling in the, the tau direction. So now essentially in our own frame, the line element becomes this expression. So this is going to turn out to be an incredibly useful expression, not only in special relativity, but also in general relativity. And now to really appreciate the importance of this equation, it's going to take us quite a while, but let's just start nibbling away at it. Essentially, what this is simply measuring is just the length of your world line. And it's essentially just measuring how much time has elapsed in your own reference frame. Because in your own reference frame, you're only moving through time. And so the length of your world line is essentially just going to directly correspond to how much time has elapsed. So this distance s squared is essentially the same as the time interval tau squared. And we just need to remember we have to have our c in there to keep the units consistent. This is a squared distance. This is a squared time. So we need a squared velocity to keep the units consistent. And this minus sign we just kind of have to deal with it. It's there from our convention. It might have felt more natural to us to associate time intervals in our own frame with positive distances, but just because of the convention we're using, we need to have this minus sign. Okay, so this is just a fairly simple expression. There's no dx part, and it's just essentially now measuring how much time has elapsed in your own frame, but now this is an incredibly useful thing to measure because essentially, well, we need to realize ds squared is going to be invariant no matter where you are or what coordinates you're using to measure space time, you're always going to agree on the value of this ds squared. So now, essentially, if everybody can agree on this ds squared, everybody can know how much time has elapsed in your own frame. And so this is now essentially what we're going to use to parameterize world lines because, well, first of all, it's a time parameter. And not only is it a time parameter, 
it's a time parameter that everybody agrees on because the value of the metric is invariant. Okay, so how is this now actually useful? Well, to begin seeing this, we need to realize that, okay, this is how the world line appears in the frame of this particle, the stationary frame. And now I'm just going to relabel the coordinates of our particle to be y. But now let's consider some other observer who is going to be stationary, but is going to view this particle as moving in their frame. So the particle y might be following some world line like this. And now So our particle that we've drawn for this reference frame is orange particle. In another reference frame, this might be how the world line of this particle appears. So this observer is going to be using coordinates t and x, and they're essentially now going to view this world line from their perspective. So now how is this delta tau definition useful? Well, first of all, we need to realize it's an invariant. So everybody is going to agree on this delta tau um, interval that has elapsed. And so this is why we can now essentially use it to parameterize any world line. First of all, because it's a time parameter and also because it's essentially available for all observers, they can all agree on its value, essentially. And now the fact that they all have to agree on this value of delta tau squared essentially means that the space-time length of this world line is fixed. Effectively, it's fixed to be the length of proper time that has elapsed in that particle's reference frame. And so the arc length of this curve the ds squared, just simply now the purely geometric length of this curve is constrained by the amount of proper time which elapsed. So this is an incredibly important point to get your head around and to start getting used to is that in your own reference frame your world line just travels along the proper time axis and however much proper time has elapsed, essentially how long your world line has been from wherever you started measuring, that physical space-time length is going to have to be the same length as this observer is going to measure for your world line. But now a really key point is that because this observer, essentially this world line isn't straight in their coordinates, it has some components that point in the space direction and the time direction, this length is going to effectively no longer just be a pure time interval, it's going to also have some space interval to that length. Because now, just really roughly and intuitively, if we imagine taking this straight length, it's straight along the tau axis, and we place it in our new set of coordinates, if we measure this length, well, the straight length which I had in the tau coordinates, this is delta tau, because essentially now we need to wrap this straight length, we need to wrap it around this curve, it's going to introduce some bending into this length, and rather than being a pure space-time length, it's going to get bent some way into the space um, length as well. Okay, so effectively your space-time length or the length of your world line is fixed because it's simply just given by how much proper time has elapsed in your own reference frame and then this proper time interval is kind of translated into a full space-time interval in some other reference frame and now that full space-time interval in the other reference frame is not just going to be a purely temporal interval, 
because essentially this um, this line doesn't always just point straight up a single axis, it has kind of components in either direction. And so when we translate this distance onto this curve, parts of it are going to start having delta x components. So we're going to see more of this now after I've talked about fall velocity. Um, and we're going to see that effectively using the invariance of this interval, we can essentially realise that your fall velocity is also fixed to have a constant length. And this is going to produce a very similar effect in that essentially in some coordinates, fall velocity is going to have differing space and time components. But now essentially just to summarise what I've introduced here, this incredibly important realisation that essentially we can take space-time distances measured in any frame and realise that they're invariant, so we can just measure distances in our own frame and work out how much time has elapsed in our own frame, and we refer to this as the proper time interval, and then effectively this proper time interval constrains for all other observers how this world line is going to appear, because effectively the space-time length of that world line has been set, and it's just up to that reference frame to distribute that fixed length over some amount of space and time coordinates.